since we've seen the increases of interest rates and and so aggressively so over the last couple of years there have been just news article after news article about renewals and how renewals are going to be a big problem covid rates are gone and are now five times the you know the amount and you know that there's going to be a huge sticker shock on renewal that's going to flood the market with inventory because a lot of people are going to be forced to sell because they can't requalify. Now, essentially, I guess what we're hearing is that all of that is now bust. That doesn't really apply anymore. With the removal of the stress test, it will open up most people to now really aggressively shop their renewals, which will hopefully in turn lead to more competition and lower rates at renewal. Welcome to Supply and Demand with Adam Nadler. This is a podcast dedicated to the real estate market in Canada, available now on YouTube, Apple Music, and Spotify. Jeff Mudrick, back again, actually a lot sooner than I was expecting because there have been, again, more new mortgage rules that are making it easier and easier for people out there which will inevitably kind of just heat up the market overall. So explain to everybody what new rules, again, they have now implemented to make things easier on everyone. Every week, we're hopping on another podcast episode to talk about the benefits the government is making to the mortgage world. Benefit to existing home buyers, for some, homeowners for some, the benefits to prospective homeowners uh, and other changes. But today's announcement all focused on the fact that um, as of November 19th, anybody whose mortgage is up for renewal will not have to requalify using the stress test. So the stress test was implemented in 2018, and a stress test uh, said that in order to qualify for a mortgage, you qualify based on the greater of 5.25% or your interest rate plus 2%, the greater of. So right now, when interest rates are all over 4%, and for the past couple of years, when interest rates are closer to 6%, it'd be very, very challenging to qualify for a mortgage. And when folks would come up for mortgage renewal, it was very difficult to qualify to bring your mortgage to a new lender. The impacts of this was the, uh, the current lender of, the, um, of clients would not need to offer competitive renewal rates because most of the time clients were not qualifying with new lenders. So now with the removal of the stress test, it will open up most people to now really aggressively shop their renewals, which will hopefully in turn lead to more competition and lower rates at renewal. Okay, so this is a a, a really big deal because since we've seen the increases of interest rates and and so aggressively so over the last couple of years there have been just news article after news article about renewals and how renewals are going to be a big problem covid rates are gone and are now five times the you know the amount and you know that there's going to be a huge sticker shock on renewal that's going to flood the market with inventory because a lot of people are going to be forced to sell because they can't requalify. Now, essentially, I guess what we're hearing is that all of that is now bust. That doesn't really apply anymore. Yeah, here's the uh, here's the interesting thing. I've just been like running some numbers and the idea around, yes, hey, you know, renewal, the renewal sticker shock, it can still be a thing, but when, for example, one lender is offering you a renewal rate at 6%, and today you might not qualify to move lenders, when the actual market rate is 4%, you can, take, you can now take that 4%, and the sticker shock doesn't go away, but it's significantly less than what it would be uh, you know, for the past few years. So I agree with you for sure that the idea around this is... It's going to be all these new listings because people cannot afford their homes. Um, the announcement today, coupled with just lower interest rates in general, are really going to, uh, to squash that, that idea. There's also been a lot of talk about the next interest rate announcement 
being a 50 basis point reduction, given the fact that we've hit the 2% target of inflation, whether or not that's true or not is a whole nother can of worms. Obviously, inflation numbers are, are completely politicized and that's all very true. But the Fed seems to have kind of paved the way for that. And we see a lot of liquidity injection, not only from the Fed, but from um, the central bank in China and in the UK. I mean, just global liquidity seems to be rising. And this is kind of giving a lot of green lights for the Bank of Canada to do the same. And they all seem to be moving in unison, uh, including the EU. So Talk a little bit about that. Given this new change, less sticker shock, more competitive rates and more competitive um, you know, markets within renewals between banks, how is this affecting your day-to-day -day when you're actually talking to underwriters, when people are actually calling you about the renewals? How, how is this news kind of playing out? Or, or if it hasn't yet, how do you expect it to be playing out? It, yeah, it's still so new. So has not i think the announcements are just kind of you know social media is starting to <laughs> heat up with it because it's still very very new but i imagine i'll like next week i'm already we already know like the calendar is going it is and will continue to be booked with phone calls from people saying hey sweet let me shop my renewal which is exactly what should happen um when it comes to the fed and what they did uh a few weeks a couple weeks ago with that half point reduction and our upcoming bank of canada announcement in three and a half weeks to four weeks time um yeah, you're right it does open it does open tiff to uh to cut by more than just a quarter it it would be aggressive because we're seeing the uh we're seeing inflation numbers come in at target and this was not expected to happen this quickly so you know it's will they do it they, uh, of course they can Right now, we're still seeing such a huge gap between fixed and variable interest rates, like well over a 1% gap. So I imagine from like a lender standpoint, they want their books to be balanced-ish, although they'll make more money on, uh, on fixed rate mortgages. Um, balance is good. So will we see some more uh, extra like discount off of prime coming up? I would say yeah, that's a reasonable expectation. But at the same time, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Lenders are getting very, very aggressive with their fixed rate mortgages and competing with one another. And when I see when I uh, see this happening, when every lender has these rate specials for fixed rate mortgages, only fixed rate mortgages, what does that tell you? It tells me that banks and lenders want their clients in fixed rate mortgages more so than variable rate. And to me, that means maybe they're projecting that variable rates are going to plummet and uh, let's lock in these these clients while we can. Yeah, because I think that there's a big misunderstanding out there between the overnight rate and fixed rates. And we, you know, being in the business, kind of understand this intuitively that just because the Bank of Canada announces that the overnight rate is going down, that doesn't necessarily mean that fixed rates have gone down. Um, doesn't, a little no, bit you got it. Yeah, explain that to people because that that's a very huge misconception. Yeah, every single time there's a bank of Canada announcement, I have to, I have this conversation a lot. And it's a great question. Uh, so the Bank of Canada only impacts the overnight lending rate, the overnight lending rate, and the overnight lending rate is the sole thing that impacts uh, variable rate mortgages. Fixed rates rise and fall based off of a little bit of what the bank like what's said in that announcement. But they rise and fall throughout the month, uh, every single month, based on what's happening in the in the Government of Canada bond yield market. So if you were to Google five-year Government of Canada bond yield, when the, when the graph is up, fixed rates are higher. When the graph is down, fixed rates are lower. Uh, all the month, the full month of September, we've seen this uh, on the graph. It's just a, a steady decline in that bond yield market. Uh, meaning that's why we've seen so much, like a huge drop in fixed rate mortgages, honestly, in the past month. We had clients who uh, closed on their mortgage six weeks ago, under 5%, and they were absolutely thrilled. And rightfully so. Like, we hadn't seen under 5% in, in a year and a half, so they were thrilled. However, you know, now... <laughs> Not as thrilled uh, because rates are in like under four and a half percent. So 
Uh, this is all in the last six weeks. Given that a lot of these changes come into effect in November and the most recent announcements as well in, uh, I believe it's December 15th or the next uh, implementation of these changes on uh, the increased amortization and um, increased cap on insured um, uninsured mortgages. It looks like 2025 is going to be a bit of um, a, a bit of a frenzy when it comes to people's ability to be able to service the pent-up demand within the real estate market. How do you see that transpiring with the immigration that we've seen? Like, how are the people who have come to this country in the last couple of years going to be able to qualify? um a little bit easier because they they've been they've been here they originally flooded the rental market as interest rates went up and people got pushed out of the market have now built up credit so now they they do have credit and are ideally going to follow that canadian dream of owning your own home um how are they going to be impacted with all these changes are they going to be able to afford a little bit more a little bit more home it's going to it's a huge positive impact for anyone, any really, any first-time home buyer, but for for newer immigrants who don't have the two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars required to get into the market, you, know, you can get in with a gorgeous property for under a hundred thousand uh, dollars of a down payment. The issue previously, or even currently until December fifteenth, with a lot of these uh, newer to Canada folks, is their down payment. It's not their income because, like you said, they have. Pretty, like good jobs at this point, credit is established. It's just, you know, it's it's very hard to save this hundreds of thousands of dollars required to purchase a property over a million bucks. So now, again, in theory, this is the way it's supposed to, this is the way it can work now. Um, they just announced, this was the last time we spoke, it was not out yet, but the guidelines for the minimum down payment have been established where it's 5% of the first $500,000 and 10% of the difference up to 1.5 million bucks. So we weren't sure about this, um, but Ms. Ms. Freeland has announced that this is, the, this is the way it's going to be. So in theory, you can buy a $1.5 million home with as little as $125,000 of a down payment. Yeah, which is insane. That's, that's pretty insane. It's insane for a couple of reasons. And maybe what I'll do, I'll share something with you and you can, and you can fire it out. Uh, if any listeners want, just co connect with Adam. But the way, like, <clears throat> you need the way, 25000 If ahead. you want to show a spreadsheet, you can totally share your screen. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to open something up and just, and just do a little quick glance for you because it, it is a little bit scary. <laughs> um, it's essentially just the mortgage insurance premium associated with taking a mortgage of up to or buying a house with the minimum down payment up to one and a half million that like cmhc has not come out with their premium associated with that but the expectation is that it's going to be like well over thirty thousand bucks for just the insurance premium um that gets lumped into the total mortgage amount so oh sorry way over thirty thousand let me uh let me see if i can pull something up here this is this is that scary part where um, like everyone just has yeah, everybody just has to be a little a little and, uh, and this is all happening right on the heels of um, the the NDP pulling out of their deal with the Liberals. All of a sudden, Christian Freeland comes out with these all these announcements, and they're coming fast and furious right away. You know, so it's just. You know, you you think that housing is this issue that that you know the liberals really care about, and they talk about it all the time. But really, they only care about it when they're when they're you know stranglehold on the power that they're wielding in government is is threatened. It's it's crazy. It. And and this is, this is definitely the scary part. So I know I'm just we're just doing this on the fly. So if anyone's watching, if anyone's looking at this. Like, don't worry about the interest rate or all that. But here's the way it works right now. Let me just flip this around. The current way of looking at it is the insurance premium is if you're putting the minimum down payment, it's 4%. So 
So for a million dollar property, insurance premium is $37,000. Ton of money. It is what it is. We're not sure about this number here. We're not sure exactly what the insurance premium is going to be, what these insurers are going to charge to insure a property bought with the minimum down payment up to 1.5. Like 4.2% is pretty, it's a pretty decent number to look at. So this is the this is where it gets wild. The insurance premium amount is $57,000, almost $58,000. It gets lumped into the total mortgage amount. So even though you're putting $125,000 on a down payment down, your mortgage is still going to be $1.432 million. So if you take uh, your mortgage amount and divide it by the purchase price, we're essentially like debt servicing. It's like over 95% of, the, of your property is is mortgage and four and a half percent is is your equity in the property that's what How worries it? me okay so i know i knew i knew that i had a feeling you would like this uh yeah well like a, a 95.52 percent loan to value loan ratio to value. That's, that's what it is i mean that's insane right like we always understood that our our a lenders you know, our, the big five banks in Canada were rock solid because they always did an 80-20. But when they're doing a 95-5, um, you know, and we have a backstop of the CMHC, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but all that that means is that the government of Canada will be on the hook should these mortgages not pay. CMHC, Sajin... Canada guarantee. These are all these insurers that, yeah, like they're definitely government backed. And this, you know, what happens if the value of this property dips? You know, it, it, we we just saw it happen the last two years. So if the value of this property dips to you know one four two five. We're in a negative. Uh, um, or, you know, this loan amount would stay the same. So, anyways, if it did, yeah, like one four two five. This loan amount stays the same. Anyways, we're like a negative, we're in a negative loan to value. The bank right. is on the hook for more than what uh, the client owns. So, but then the bank it is scary. But then the bank can't foreclose. Like the bank can't do anything yeah. about it. There, there's no, there's no benefit to the bank to foreclose. It makes more sense for the. I don't know what they would do. It would make more sense for the bank at this point to let the client not pay their mortgage in the hopes that eventually the property will appreciate again. Right. Very, right. Very scary. So basically we, we were kind of taking our entire real estate market and putting a government backstop on it where now not only it's, it's not really that the government would be bailing out the banks. It's that the government is becoming the bank in a way, right? Like they are securing these loans, they are giving out that extra down. Is it not? Is that not the case? We'll see like what, again, like for all of these insured mortgages, like, you know, you can see the insurance premiums, it's a lot of money. So when clients are spending 60 or $70,000 on this premium, there's men there. I don't, I, I'm going to figure out the percentage decently, a decent percentage of mortgages in Canada are insured. So, you know, they're paying that premium. Uh, to ensure that if clients foreclose, see, like that's that's what it's insurance, right? So I don't know if the reserve funds of these companies or these corporations. Um, I would say if we're seeing a big dip in the market and a lot of foreclosures are supposed to happen, like they'll they'll readjust these rates and start charging a little bit more. Like they, they, these are insurance companies. Well, they're insurance companies, but they're. I mean, the CMHC is a Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. It's a crown corporation. It's yes. it it is the government. That's what it is, right? So if they need a payout, um, on uh, you know, on, on on whatever it is that they're insuring, right? If there's a claim there that they need a payout, it's essentially correct me if I'm wrong. But it's just the government printing money to paper over the losses, right? Is that not just putting us back in the inflationary cycle that we just barely climbed out of this time? 
I think that's a very fair point to make. I, I'm so curious to look at the number of insured mortgages that do go into default. Because in situations like this, it's not just these one that 95.5% loan to value is still applicable now when clients are buying at a million dollars and putting the minimum down payment and paying that big insurance premium. But it's just what we saw over the last couple of years, the volatility of the higher over million dollar properties, like the some of those valuations have, have uh, come in quite short uh, over the past year or so. So it doesn't say they don't bounce back up. But yeah, we've seen a we've seen a trying time. So that's what makes me nervous when I was running the numbers and seeing high high insurance premium, minimum one hundred twenty five thousand dollars down payment, like that ninety five five loan to value is a huge number on that. It's huge side of the purchase. It's huge, and and this is one you know, I mean Canadians love to look to government for, I don't know any nice way to say it. It's just government parentalism. Like they really feel like the government's looking out for their best interest, but this is just levering up our economy and our real estate market more than it already was. This encourages the financialization of housing more than it already was. And this also creates, because it's more leverage, a more volatile marketplace in general. This There's no way when you zoom out and look at this situation, there is no way that this is a good thing. All this is, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong or if you feel any different, this to me is just political theater. This is just oh. terrible. I would say it is, I think, I think just like anything, there will be people who gen- genuinely will take, it, like, take advantage of it in a good way, like use it because they have high incomes. They don't have a down payment like, that makes sense to me, but there's also going to be people who use and abuse it and take advantage of it. And those are like, these are the situations where, you know, we're in a bit of a, a tough spot. So I'm going to share one more thing with you. Um, let me know when you're able to kind of see it. So yeah. just, just showcasing the difference between the 25 versus a 30 year amortization. And yes, the insurance premiums an estimate, it's going to be higher for, for a 30 year. This is for an $800,000 purchase price. Like we're seeing a monthly payment, $332 less with a higher interest rate, but just because of that extended amortization. So, you know, I, I put, we put savings here. Is it savings? No, but no. From a monthly from a monthly, you're paying $300 less per month, but I should add another one amount of extra interest in cure, like uh, spent because that is the, challenge that we're going to see is everyone i've talked to so far is very excited because of this here but in my opinion it 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 really shouldn't be this that's providing the excitement it should be um a a cause for concern of course yes because people are are canadians are so focused on their monthly payments that they're not looking at the interest over time and this is why if if you remember back to our podcast that we had like a year ago, is I I was saying that this was going to happen. If people have been listening to the podcast, they've heard me say this a million times over the last two years, is they're just going to keep extending amortizations. They're just going to keep extending amortizations. They're going to create forever loans. And that's essentially what this they is. Did they did it. And and they're going to keep doing it. They're going to take, right now it's 30 years. It's, it's going to go to 35. It's going to go to 40 eventually because this system is a debt-based monetary system. You cannot keep the party going without kicking that can down the road. And essentially what that does is through the financialization of housing, it creates indentured servitude through mortgages. Like it's kind of insane. And and as long as those monthlies, you know, stay down, that's all people care about, you know, it's just going to perpetuate the madness. But anyways, that's me ranting now. I thank you so much for your time and explaining this and taking the time to explain this for all of our viewers. I know that this is something that is super important and nobody's watching the bouncing ball, but we are for you guys and we're always going to bring you back to uh, to explain exactly what's going on. So thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate your time as always. Super happy to, to come on and hopefully uh, people are 
walking away with just some new information that, that they can use. Awesome. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone.